Thank you. Such a pleasure to be here. So I'm going to start by asking you uh, what happened November 22nd, 1963. <laughs> Kennedy got shot. And how did most Americans learn that Kennedy had gotten shot? Radio and television. And in fact, most Mer Americans who uh, have a memory of that can tell you that Walter Cronkite right, took off his glasses and cried on national television, which was a shock. And now, if I say the word Watergate, what's the first thing that pops into your head? Woodward and Bernstein. <laughs> of course. And then I always feel obligated to mention the New York Times. They had something to do with it, too. Here's another kind of critical moment in American history, which we experienced and came to understand primarily through the eyes and the work of journalists. And then uh, let's fast forward another 15, 20 years, and we have the fall of the Berlin Wall, another kind of canonical moment in American history. And it was the fall of the Berlin Wall that took CNN from Ted Turner's strange vanity project to a genuine source of news for many Americans. And then who can forget September 11th, right? Uh, it, it was pre-Google, if you can believe it. And uh, I, I'm pretty sure the entire world stopped twice a day for 10 days when Rudy Giuliani did his live press conferences. It was on every channel. These major milestone events in American history, we all experienced through our media, through our journalists. And now, how did most Americans learn Osama bin Laden had been killed? Well, this guy Keith Urban tweeted, so I'm told by a reputable person they've killed Osama bin Laden, hot damn. <laughs> Keith Urban was Donald Rumsfeld's chief of staff. And so, of course, at the time, uh, Obama was president. Uh, and so uh, he wasn't, Urban was not even in the administration. He's a Republican. He was a consultant. Uh, and he had a pretty small number of followers on Twitter, I believe about 400 or so. But he tweets this, and immediately the tweet goes viral, reaching hundreds of thousands and then millions of Americans. And th this, is, this is a perfect example of the way our news and our media has dramatically changed and the way it can, has the potential to shape our politics, right? That um, uh, in the past, Urban would have been a source to journalists. But nope, in this case, as Dave Weiner says, sources go direct. And this tweet quickly spreads. I also always have to mention Sahab Batar, who lived across the street from Osama bin Laden and accidentally live tweeted the entire thing. There's a helicopter landing on my neighbor's roof. What the hell is going on? <laughs> it's a quiet, sleepy suburban neighborhood in Pakistan. This is a, a map of the internet. If you were going to visually map the internet, this is what it would look like. This is a project out of MIT called the Opti Project. And it is, the key here is it is diffuse. The power here is totally diffuse. Um, you know, I started my life as a computer programmer and I still write some code. And I spent many years as the guy in the room, in the back of the room whose job it was to make sure that the projector was working. And so in that, in that guise, I sat in a number of uh, um, you know, meetings at the very top of government and the Democratic Party and corporate boardrooms. And, uh, and in all of these meetings, and even in many Harvard faculty meetings, I, I would listen to the people in charge talking. And I would think, boy, that doesn't sound like the world I live in. And I, I thought I was just young and stupid. And of course, now I'm no longer young. But um, and then I read this book, uh, The Guns of August by Barbara Tuckman, right, about World War I. And she, in, the, in the first five pages of The Guns of August, she describes the funeral of King Edward VII in 1910, right? King Edward VII of England dies, and in 1910, spring of 1910, every nation in the world sends their biggest ships, their biggest guns, 
and their biggest jewels to the funeral. And uh, Barbara Tuckman says it was the most opulent event in human history. And if you had been there, you would have thought the monarchy would last forever. And in fact, about 90 days later, the new king of England, King George, writes a letter to his best friends and first cousins, the Tsar of Russia and the Kaiser of Germany. And he says, just imagine in 2020, when our grandchildren are the monarchs of Europe and the colonies. And yet, the whole thing is rotted out by then. It was actually over, but they couldn't see it from where they were standing. And that is very much what I feel like is happening today, that the institutions of the 20th century, they're in many ways rotted out. They have lost their way, they've made mistakes, they've gotten corrupted or, or misdirected from their mission. And then technology comes in and adds another layer of instability to this kind of madness. And so the reason why I say, titled my talk, Remember Rule One, It Will Get Crazier, I have been saying this since 2012, every quarter, uh, is that from my perspective, our institutions are very weak. We are still in like 1910. And the, the prevailing vehicles of power are headed for some significant corrections. And this is part of how I understand our current politics. And our media has a lot to do with this. To, to get into this a bit, uh, if I was giving this talk to you 35 years ago and I, had a, and I asked you to describe a computer, you might uh, describe something like this. Right, this is a Cray supercomputer from the early 70s. It probably would have filled this stage. Uh, you dropped a problem off, you came back two weeks later, and you sat on that bench and waited for an answer. Uh, does anyone know what the base price of a, of a Cray supercomputer circa 1974 would be? Anyone wanna guess how much this computer cost? Uh, about $10 million, memory not included. <laughs> you had to buy the memory separately. And so the only person who could afford a computer, well, most people couldn't afford computers. They were only affordable to institutions, to the world's largest corporations, the world's largest governments, and the world's largest universities. So now let's do a little thought experiment. Imagine you're a nerd, much like me, and you're desperate to play with computers, and it's the early 60s, incidentally. Anyone wanna guess the first year you could major in computer science in the United States? 1962, you wanna guess the university? No. You people are such coastal elites. <laughs> it, Purdue University, 1962. So, so. Um, here you are, you're a nerd, you're desperate to play with computers, it's the 60s, your only hope of ever touching a computer is to go to a large university. Uh, and what else is happening on American university campuses in the 60s? <laughs> the anti-war movement, the civil rights movement. And so you graduate in the late, late 60s and who's hiring computer scientists? Mostly the Pentagon or IBM doing Pentagon contracts. And how many of those computer scientists who grew up on college campuses in the 60s do you think want to go work for the Pentagon? <laughs> Pretty much none of them. In, uh, in 1973, a guy named Ted Nelson wrote this book, Computer Lib, You Can and Must Understand Computers Now, which has the, uh, which is, it's a political manifesto. You cannot trust the people in charge with computers. You can't trust the man with computers. Computers are too powerful. We must do something radical. We must build the personal computer. Take power away from institutions, away from the man, and build a personal computer. And of course, uh, um, my favorite line in this book, in the future, hundreds of people will have their own computers. <laughs> and thousands will want them. Um, 
This book influenced a whole generation of computer uh, scientists. Bill Gates, with his first gazillion dollars, bought the rights to this book and republished it with Microsoft Press in 1984. If you've read the Walter Isaacson biography of Steve Jobs, it talks about the influence of this book and the movement this book was a part of. Um, and incidentally, Ted Nelson, in, who wrote this book, invented the idea of something you use every day, which is the hyperlink. Next time you click on one, you can thank Ted Nelson for not patenting it. So here we go. Uh, we go from the 70s, computers that fill a room, to the 80s, we begin to get computers on every desk. And then in the 90s, we begin to plug them all into each other to, in, in our offices and homes to share like printers. And you may, those of you who have a sufficient age, remember the H drive. And then, then we plug all the computers into all the other computers and we have the internet. And today we walk around with these devices on our person. And my uh, Apple 10 phone is so much more powerful than a Cray supercomputer super circa 1975 that you almost cannot compare them in terms of computing power. It's like, yes, a bicycle and an Airbus are both transportation. But it's, an, it's astonishing how far we've come. If I were to say to you that 35 years from now, you'll be able to walk into any strip mall anywhere in the world and for $200 and a low monthly metered fee, buy your own Boeing 777 powered by a nuclear reactor, you would think I was nuts, but that's effectively what has happened in computing over the last 35 years. And this kind of technology has consequences. Two of the biggest consequences, in my view, are one, this technology profoundly pushes power to the individual in a number of ways. It, is, it, it pushes power out of our traditional institutions of the 20th century, perhaps creating some new ones along the way, and, uh, but takes them, put, puts power out of those institutions. We're gonna talk about journalism in a minute. And, um, but it also pushes power to algorithms. Uh, to, to the ways we navigate the world. So let me unpack the algorithm and part of this a little bit. Uh, it used to be that we had information and then we had knowledge workers who distilled information into knowledge for the public, right? Knowledge workers being teachers, journalists, librarians for the most part. Uh, but something has happened in roughly the last decade, thanks to computing power and, and network technology, that's really completely thrown this all up in the air. So uh, uh, if, we, if we take all of the information ever created in human history, all the information created in human history, we'll, we'll, let's start with cave paintings, right? And then we'll go to, I guess, some of the first, um, Recorded writing is like carved onto ox bones in China, and then uh, 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 you know uh, clay tablets in Mesopotamia, and then papyrus, and and then we're we're picking up some and then we have uh, uh, the you know um, illustrated manuscripts, and then we begin to pick up some steam with the printing press, and we'll hell let, let's include paintings and oils in this kind of information. And we just keep going here and eventually we get to photography and now it's really picking up steam. Uh, radio and audio recordings and television and movies and then the internet even. All of the information created in all of human history to 2010, that's about how much information was created in the last four hours. And it is impossible to navigate this volume of information as human beings. And that means we're necessarily dependent on algorithms to help navigate, to help navigate this, this, this volume of information. And uh, not only that, but actually, we still have a lot of our traditional institutions in the mix, right? We still have universities in the New York Times and CNN and the Camden Conference. And, uh, but we also have algorithms. And then there's also some direct to the public, right? The president and any presidential candidate actually can just tweet directly to the public. And so we have all of these things happening at the same time 
and it, it's knocking all of our norms and traditions and institutional values out of whack and creating a lot of challenges. Uh, and I go back to the diffusion of power. The internet is ultimately about, about this um, enormous diffusion of power for the most part. Uh, I'm particularly interested in what this means for our media uh, and for journalism. Most of the news in the United States is created by newspapers. Uh, almost all the journalists employed in the United States are employed by newspapers, but newspapers have had a pretty tough uh, decade here. Uh, this is, this is a billions of newspaper revenue, right? About 65 plus billion dollars in, in the year 2000, and we're down in the neighborhood of 12 billion dollars a year today for the entire newspaper industry. To give you an idea, when I was at the LA Times, today is a Friday, a 40, uh, a, 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 one of our premium adverti print advertisements in the LA Times on a Friday would reach about 400,000 readers. Uh, back page, full color, cost about 40 grand. The same, to reach the same 400,000 readers on our website with a comparable ad buy would be about $5,600. And to reach the same 400,000 readers with a Google search buy, completely bypassing the LA Times would be about $16. This is kind of the fundamental economics of the newspaper industry and why it has had some collapse. But I think it's useful to know that in 1980, they were about the same number of steel workers in the United States as journalists. And today, there are more steel workers than journalists, actually. That we have this whole narrative and lexicon and kind of cultural touchstones about the steel industry. We have the, the, we call it the rust belt, for heaven's sake, right? The rust belt and the abandoned steel mills. And we have no narrative for the collapse of news in this country. It's like happened almost without anybody noticing, and it has consequences. So let's look at the consequences for a moment. First, there's just a lot less local reporting. Uh, 21 US states that used to send reporters to Washington, DC, no longer do. No local reporter in DC. That is 42 US senators who never get a question from a hometown journalist in their seven years in the US Senate. That's also 21 US states where there is no reporting. What does the health care bill mean for the hospital in our community? What does the infrastructure bill mean for our roads? What does the education bill mean for my children's schools? Not a zip. Nothing. And in fact, if you live outside the five largest cities in America, you effectively have no local news. Uh, there's also a lot less trust. Now, there's a little bit of a chicken or the egg question here, right? How did we end up uh, losing so much trust in our institutions broadly and in the media specifically? Across the board, the collapse in trust in US media is quite stark. It's about, it's stronger than almost any uh, collapse in trust over the last 40 years, except for, you guessed it, the US Congress. <laughs> and the, the trust, the decline in the trust in media is actually a, a global trend, not just a US trend. And then the third thing I wanna say is that there's a lot more junk. I don't like the term fake news because the reality is it's not usually completely fake. It's more complicated than that. Uh, maybe they're leaving out, it's true, but they're leaving out some crucial details. Maybe it's a mix of true and false. And so I prefer to call it junk or pollution, information, pollution, or junk. And so uh, this is an unpublished study we have. This is uh, from uh, the midterm elections, 2017, 2018. These are the 100, uh, the, the 100 traditional news organizations with large audiences on Facebook. You probably cannot read it, but the, the first one there is BBC News with 50 million Facebook fans, and then CNN, New York Times, all the way down to New Hampshire Public Radio's down here, right? Uh, th this is the, the top 100, uh, what we classified as junk news uh, sites on Facebook by the size of their Facebook audience. And this is them on the same graph. And so you're, if your primary source of news is Facebook, it's likely to be really polluted. It's likely to have a lot of junk in it. 
and that has consequences. And so when we think about these three things together, one, uh, the collapse of the business model for local news, creating a giant empty void in our media diets and media lives, two, a decline in trust, and three, uh, a lot more junk in part, in my opinion, I can't prove it, filling a void left by local news, that creates a real challenge around misinformation. Uh, about 14 years ago, someone sent an email that said, in a long, compelling narrative, that Barack Obama was a Muslim born outside the United States. Uh, the Washington Post estimates that 100 million Americans read that email received it and shared it to reach 100 million Americans. And I sometimes think of that email as the email that launched 1,000 PhD theses. Um, and so actually, misinformation on the internet, fake news, what have you, is pretty well studied, uh, although there's plenty more to study. And we know three things. We know three things, I think, with a high degree of confidence, although maybe some of tomorrow's speakers will challenge me on this, hopefully. The first is that rumors are sticky. The brain loves rumors, right? The second is that uh, uh, corrections backfire and fade over time. If I say to you, Barack Obama is a Muslim is a lie, what do you remember two days later? The sticky part, Barack Obama is a Muslim. And then finally, source credibility is paramount. What does this mean? If you're never gonna trust Fox News, it doesn't matter how pristine and perfect their reporting is, you just, you've just, you're just never gonna trust them, right? That, uh, that the brands and tribal identifications we culturally have have a great deal of power. All right, so let's think about these three things and think about what we can do about them, because I'm not just about problems, I'm also about solutions. So if rumors are sticky, well then, we need ways of making the truth louder, right? Now, what, what do I mean making the truth louder? Well, we need more local journalism for starters. That would help. Uh, a lot of possible vehicles there, all of them uh, long and arduous routes, but nevertheless worth investing in. I also think the big digital platforms that shape the public sphere today uh, Amazon, Apple, eBay, Facebook, Google, Snapchat, and Twitter, probably being the largest in the English language, um, they actually have an obligation to try and figure out ways of making the truth louder, those algorithms I mentioned before, right? They could, they could do a better job privileging the truth, although as I'll get to in a minute, there's a complication with that. Um, additionally, if we think about corrections backfire, well, in this, we have, to, we have to seek alternative narratives. I think one of the problems with journalism over the last 50 plus years is it, 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 journalists like the gotcha. They like, that's not true, that's a lie. Fact check, correct, right? And uh, we have to teach journalists different ways of telling stories that don't fall into some of these cognitive traps out there. Uh, a good, ex one way I think, there's a great project called the Solutions Journalism Network, which is trying to figure this out and working with newsrooms around the country. But a good example is, rather than say Barack Obama is a Muslim is a lie, is false, you could say, here are photos of the church where Barack Obama was baptized. I've interviewed Barack Obama's godparents at his baptism. You have to find other ways of telling the narrative so as to, avoid the, what sometimes we call the familiarity challenge of, of, of fact-checking and corrections. And then finally, the hardest one really is source credibility is paramount. Um, you know, uh, how do we involve tribal leaders to solve this problem? You know, I, I think at this point it was kind of malpractice that every time senior Republicans, including Mitch McConnell and Paul Ryan, were on Meet the Press, Chuck Todd should have asked them over the last 12 years, do you believe Barack Obama is a Muslim born outside the United States? But not asking that question 
not forcing those tribal leaders to go on the record, their passive approach, their reluctance to ever correct that becomes a real problem in terms of countering that particular piece of misinformation. Of course, famously, John McCain did it during his presidential campaign. It came up frequently in the town halls when he was running for president, and every single time he corrected it, and he frequently got booed for the correction. But he was, he was a relatively lone voice in that. So that's, that's a bit of a start if we understand some of the pr things we know are, are problems and what the solutions might look like. Um, but I don't want to leave you on such an optimistic note. Uh, there are still some real problems out there. Uh, you know, the, the collapse of new local news doesn't have a straightforward solution. The business model of newspapers resting substantially on advertising just isn't going to work anymore. And so we have to figure out what new models might look like that are necessarily more complicated and different. Um, a second major issue is these digital platforms that control a lot of the public sphere and discussion uh, are opaque. We don't actually know how much misinformation there is on Facebook or on YouTube because they won't tell us. And the, the way, because they're opaque, it's very hard to figure out how big some of these problems are and what effective interventions might look like. The third real issue is, you know, uh, as someone who writes code and cares a lot about uh, math and <laughs> algorithms, uh, truth is actually really hard to measure. Trust is much easier to measure. Uh, a lot of our uh, platforms, especially, for example, Google Search, what they really measure is trust. They don't measure truth. And uh, trust, trust is more easily manipulated in a sense, right? Trust is not the same thing as truth. And a lot of our digital ecosystem is actually built on trust and measuring trust, which has, uh, which has its shortcomings. Because measuring truth is hard. So when I, when I look at the, the instability of the current moment, uh, you know, I. I think I've been pretty clear with my analogy to World War I. I think we're at the beginning, we're at the very beginning of a one or two or three decade long, a generation long uh, collapse of traditional institutions and vehicles for power. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to get them to, we'll be able to rebuild them and find new ways of carrying the kind of core values forward. Uh, but when I struggle with this, I always, I always think back to the, the, the founding fathers of the United States of America. Here were these men, of course, all of them uh, uh, white men, most of them wealthy. They had only really ever known one form of government, right, uh, which was a hereditary monarchy. And they just kind of sat down and invented a totally different way of doing things. It's, it, it never ceases to astonish me and amaze me. And not only did they sit down and invent it, but a lot of them really didn't like each other. They weren't like Thomas Jefferson and John Adams were not friends for most of the, at the end of their lives they were. But they really didn't like each other that much. But they all came together to figure out a new way of doing things. And that's, that's my, the great inspiration to me for the moment we're in, that there's an opportunity to really dramatically reimagine where we might go here as a country, as a, as a globe, uh, and, and, and even in our own individual relationships. But it's, it, there are significant challenges ahead. It's going to be a little difficult, so you better, you better take some friends with you. Thank you very much. Looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. That was wonderful. And more to come here, my good friends. All right. We have to talk, because we're all going to be locked together 
for the next couple of days about a couple things about how we want to do things. Veterans of this conference know this already. I will be brief. Keyword is brief. In order for as many people as possible to get a chance to participate in these Q and A's, you know, sometimes you go to these conferences and the moderator guy and the person on stage suck all the air out of the room and then there's like one question from the audience, which I think is wrong and obnoxious. It's the opposite here. I'm not gonna hold forth, it's gonna be you. But we want as many of you, you, and those of you at the satellite locations to participate. So in order for that to be possible, we are looking for impressively concise questions, okay? <laughs> Let me offer the best example that I know of what we're looking for here. So um, my wife Mary and I were in London when I was foreign correspondent for Marketplace, and the political story of the decade hits in November of 1990. Longtime British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher was knocked off in an internal party coup one night. And, you know, it was astonishing after 11 years in power, uh, there was a leadership challenge at the uh, Conservative Party meeting and she had to resign. We hadn't heard from Mrs. Thatcher and then I saw on the bulletins that I get that she would appear for the first time to address uh, media questions the next morning on the equivalent of Morning Edition, the BBC's domestic program called uh, the Today Program on radio. And anyone who's anyone in that country who wants to talk to the nation uses that time slot at 8.06 in the morning to address the nation. So I'm you know, in our bureau at home thinking, boy, if it was up to me and I had Mrs. Thatcher, what clever long question would I ask? I'd probably make references to history, Lord Acton. I would have all sorts of things that made me look smart. So there it is, coming up on eight, five minutes after eight, and then six minutes after eight, and what question will the BBC guy ask? And this is what he does, and he is our model for us here at the Camden Conference. Brian Redhead was the host, and he said, six minutes past eight, Mrs. Thatcher has resigned. Joining us from the studio in Manchester is the Prime Minister. Mrs. Thatcher, what gives? <laughs> Either two or seven syllables, if you count the Mrs. Thatcher, what gives? Uh, it's, you can do that too. Uh, something else that helps us identify yourself by um, your name and your hometown only. Um, one person, one question is the tradition here. One person, one question. You know, we have students who also want to participate. We'll get in as many people as possible. We ask that your question be two syllables. Now, it, you know, if you get to be 90 seconds, there's going to be a sound, an embarrassing sound. Um, a form of social control, the sound of a tick-tock ticking away. Um, so, you know, wrap it up if you hear the sound. Um, if you're here in the Camden Opera House with us at this venue uh, and you want to ask a question, you can signal. We have runners with microphones both up there and down here. And we'll try to get you in turn. If possible, please stand so these cameras can pick you up so that they can see you in the other locations. In Rockland, Belfast, Portland, and Hanover, folks in the audience will signal the volunteer and they'll get a question form and they can write down their question and then it gets transmitted to us here and we can read it out. The text of the questions from the satellite locations emailed here. And to streamline things, our team will consolidate questions if there are similar ones. If you hear your question not quite worded the way you worded it, you can know that it was part of some wonderful meeting of minds on your question. Now, get your questions ready, okay? I get the first question. <laughs> Nico, I, I want to ask you this. You mentioned um, the source credibility issue. Do you think that we as individuals could be in part a solution to that issue? You heard me on the radio today. I am supremely annoyed by people who forward things that turn out to be fake and go, oh, whatever, it was fake. Um, I, want to live in a world where if you think you want to forward something to the public or to your friends, that you've done a little bit of digging and figure out what the source is, and you've done some thinking about whether or not it's credible. Can we have a role in this? 
Absolutely. I think uh, there's no doubt media literacy and news literacy are a pretty crucial part of the solution here. Um, and there is, there is more and more good work being done to bring uh, news and media literacy into um, middle schools, high schools, and colleges. Uh, but, you know, I think even uh, Josh Tucker is in the audience will be speaking tomorrow. Some of his research shows that the problem of spreading misinformation is more prevalent, shall we say, among older people, not younger people, who aren't exercising as uh, the judgment that perhaps they should. Uh, so I think that we all have a uh, responsibility to to take seriously the kinds of things we're, we're sharing online. Is there a question from the floor here? Where is it? Anybody got a mic here? I can't quite see as well as I want to. Oh, it's over here. Tell us your name and your town. Um, my, oh gosh, um, my name is Kate Kopp. I'm from Bar Harbor. Um, and I'm wondering if you see a model for local news somewhere in the world that you think is working? <laughs> well, um, you know, in the US, we have a very unusual system in a sense. Uh, we don't really have public funded media the way most other uh, industrialized nations do. I mean, I think in the, in the UK, um, they, it's something, it's in, in the neighborhood of, I think, 86, $87 per capita goes to the BBC. In the US, it's, it's I think, less than $3. That puts us somewhere like number 77, I think, in nations of the world spending on public media per capita. Um, um, of course, there's plenty of arguments about some state-owned media that perhaps is not journalism in the way we would all think of journalism. But nevertheless, even among the G7, the United States is very much at the bottom of the barrel in terms of public funded media. And uh, there's some evidence that public funded media actually helps create a stronger market for other kinds of commercial news media, um, which is kind of an interesting and somewhat of a paradox of sorts. Um, you know, in the US, historically, it's for 150 years, we've really, almost all of our news media has been funded by advertising and has been for profit commercial ventures. And uh, I, I, I don't think that will be true in my lifetime on a current trajectory. I mean, I'm very hopeful about the ability to find uh, alternative models. It's, I think, fair to say a big chunk of my life's work. Uh, but uh, right now, the movement in the United States is towards more philanthropically funded local journalism. Uh, you know, off-sided is the Texas Tribune or Voices of San, Voices of San Diego. Um, I think here in Maine you have uh, the, uh, is it Pine Tree? Is that, is that right? So uh, philanthropically funded local journalism is increasingly the direction. I'll note that there's more money that goes to the ballet in the United States than to journalism philanthropically. And so there's obviously, you might say, some room for growth there. Uh, nevertheless, I'm still a little skeptical that philanthropy will ever replace the, the, this, the breadth scope, diversity of the commercial news media in the United States. And in some sense, I think we got to wait for some of these models to really die and for demand to build so as to help lead to the creation of new, of new, new models, new vehicles. How about these rich folks that are buying these newspapers? Does that help? I am, uh, uh, I am both grateful and skeptical at the same time. Um, you know, uh, it's hard for me to believe Jeff Bezos didn't see some reasons to own the Washington Post that were perhaps not entirely altruistic. Uh, you know, worth, worth noting that one of Amazon's largest and growing sectors is federal government spending and defense appropriations. Um, uh, certainly it does look like it's come at some cost to him politically. And, you may have heard that Amazon's now suing the US government because they were denied this big defense contract and they seem to have reason to believe they were denied that because of the Post's coverage of, um, of the president. Um, so I'm sure it's complicated, but nevertheless, there's real political power in owning a newspaper. Um, I remember uh, a discussion about this when I was in LA, that there's a lot of billionaires in California 
but generally speaking, only one of them owns the LA Times, and that's the one the governor calls back right away. And uh, I think there's some truth to that kind of writ large, or, you know, that n newspapers have a lot of credibility and power in communities, and despite the traditional firewall, that's still, you know, I don't love, I don't love billionaire owners. Is there a question up here, I think, from the balcony? So, tell, tell us your name, sir. It appears that data-based. Tell us your name. Oh, Brian Strong. Hi there. Summer resident. <laughs> Happy to be up here for the conference. So, uh, it appears that big data-based AI is in the process of replacing logic-based code, the kind that you and I write. Is that profound? Well, uh, that is an interesting question. I mean, I don't, I don't know that I would draw such a sharp distinction per se. You know, what, artificial intelligence, I think, is a, is a difficult and potentially misleading term. Um, and people mean lots of things when they say it. I, I, I think of it as machine learning, is logic-based code that incorporates some ongoing learning into its, into, into, its, um, into its execution. And I do think it's a pretty big change, actually. I do think it's potentially a profound change in how we uh, navigate and run, run our lives. I mean, the, most of you, probably, most of us, don't even realize the extent to which machine learning shapes, which some people call artificial intelligence, shapes your life right now. Uh, lots of decisions are made for you every day. Every time you Google something, decisions are made for you individually that are not made for anybody else. Um, you know, if we were all to take out our phones right now and all of us Google Jaguar, some of you would get an NFL football team, some of you would get National Geographic, some of you would get a car company, some of you would get something else. I mean, there's just a huge amount of uh, personalization and, um, and decisions really being made for you through machine learning all the time that aren't always evident. And the reality is we kind of need it. You, you couldn't navigate, you know, you couldn't navigate most of, of, of the information technology world without those kinds of decisions being made. Where it gets really interesting and challenging is, um, uh, is as these systems get more and more sophisticated and that makes them harder to understand and harder to hold accountable. Um, so, um, uh, you know, this project I'm involved in at Harvard, I'm the faculty co-chair of the Council for the Responsible Use of Artificial Intelligence. And we have been collecting a bunch of case studies of Fortune 100 corporations that have built some kind of machine learning or AI for a business purpose and then um, in many cases decided not to deploy it because of some kind of um, bias or risk they saw in the system. So a, a Fortune 100 company who we uh, worked with or we studied, I should say, uh, had built a, a, an AI for their HR. They look at hundreds of thousands of resumes a year and they thought, oh, we ought to be able to automate a lot of this. Uh, but, you know, you have to train machines using data, and the data that uh, they had, based on 50 years of hiring, had in it a lot of sexist and racist uh, decisions uh, in the data. And so when the machine learns on that data, then its decisions are sexist and racist. And so, you know, if we want to change kind of systemic racism and sexism, if we want to make sure the, the, uh, the, the biases of the past that became institutionalized in public policy and corporate practice don't come with us into the future, then when we look at the way we're building machine learning and artificial intelligence, we have to be actually pretty careful, it turns out, that uh, we don't doom ourselves to re repeat the mistakes of the past. 
you're very careful not to say what company that was. It got out what company that was. It, <laughs> to, their, to their credit, they pulled they the pulled software it back. themselves they pulled it back. without. Correct. It wasn't a reaction to a, a public stink. It was they saw that this thing was biased against women. I, I won't say the name either. Their ticker symbol is AMZN. Um, <laughs> the, uh, is there a question over here? Hi, tell us your name and what Hi. town? Hi, Vicki Dudera, Camden. I listened today in the program with Jen, and one of the points that you made is that uh, our political discourse, it's not about whether we agree or disagree, and as you said, that's been going on in American politics for a long time, that we haven't disagreed, and uh, we haven't agreed. But the problem today seems to be that we can't agree on a baseline, we can't agree on science, we can't agree on facts, we can't agree on a truth. How do you address that so that we can move forward? That's right. So earlier today, uh, we had this discussion about partisanship. And I was just saying that, that extreme partisanship doesn't bother me at all. It's a long and healthy American tradition. I'm pretty comfortable with real extreme partisan polarization. What I'm not comfortable with is, uh, is if, we're not on this, if we're not using the same facts, right? that we have, to, we have some fundamental starting point. Uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, Patrick Moynihan said, everyone's in, entitled to their own opinions, but not their own facts. Um, and I think uh, the, there's lots of ways to have a highly partisan and really contentious argument and discussion and debate if we're starting with the same set of facts. And in the current environment, that's a, that's a real challenge. I mean, I, I was really struck the last two days, you know, where the entire national intelligence and, and national defense apparatus of the United States says that A, Russia influenced the election in 2016, or attempted, uh, or sought to influence the election in 2016, and is seeking to influence the 2020 election, and the President of the United States says that's not true. And, you know, uh, the, the, that, that the, the problem is not so much partisanship as uh, kind of integrity in, 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 in evidence and facts. And where we, go on, where we go on that front is very difficult, actually. Uh, and I, I hope some of the other panelists tomorrow and Sunday will have a better answer for you. Jeff, probably Jeff has a better answer for you. I don't have a good answer for you on that front. I mean, I, I think expertise has been under attack in the United States for uh, decades. I, I, I do think Silicon Valley has made it much more, has taken a much more aggressive attack on expertise. Um, you know, I remember almost, uh, about a decade ago visiting Google, and every time I said the word journalist, my colleague at Google, my friend at Google, corrected me and said content creator. And I was like, well, my mother takes pictures of her grandchildren, that's content creation. It's not the same thing as being a journalist. Even Uber, even Uber, you know, I, had, uh, I, had, I was in an Uber and my driver had a seizure while driving, hit 12 trees and wrapped the car around a telephone pole. Um, and I barely survived, and um, that's like the deep professionalization of driving. That guy should never, he should never have been driving any passengers in any commercial vehicle, and had we been in, an, in, you know, in a taxi cab company, he never would have gotten a taxi cab license. So I, I think deep professionalization and his corresponding impact on expertise is a, is a pretty serious problem. Um, and you can really ask any doctor or lawyer this. Um, you know, I'm as guilty as anyone. I have a strange spot on my arm. I Google it, and I'm convinced I have some terrible disease. <laughs> and my doctor thinks I'm nuts. Uh, but uh, but th th that, that, in some sense, is the root issue, is the attack on expertise. And I don't, um, it, it's, a, it's a big challenge. There aren't, there aren't easy answers to that one, I don't think. I mean, they're kind of, another way, I think in some sense they're kind of root, the only way to solve problems like that are really in our communities at a very local level. One of the challenges of the kind of global networked age is we want all the solutions to kind of be national solutions. And I'm, at this point, more or less unconvinced there are national solutions to most of these challenges, whether they be climate change or increasing the quality, quantity, and respect for knowledge, evidence-based learning in the United States. I mean, it's heavy what you're saying, because an attack on expertise is also an attack on science. 
Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's like it's, it's yeah, for sure. But you know, you know, I always I get into fights with some of my uh, conservative friends and relatives who, well, if you're going to reject evolution and climate change, why don't you give me back your iPad and your flat screen TV and your you know <laughs> your, your Tesla or whatever? Like, like these things, these these all build on each other, right? That's the nature of of uh, the history and theory of knowledge. We have a question from up here. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. You know, I don't see it on the screen. Is it behind me? No. It's not on here either. There it is. Oh, there it is. Can you give us a st one sec? I totally will come to you next. We have a question from one of the satellite locations. We hope to get even more. You say we need to reimagine, but isn't this what the president, Trump, is already doing? Absolutely, it is what he's already doing. Um, you know, uh, my last book, which came out in 2012, I said, uh, I think it's page 92, if this keeps up, a narcissistic lunatic will be president within 10 years. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but fundamentally, fundamentally, this is like Trump really understands a few things. He understands power. I think he understands power than perhaps, better than perhaps any president since LBJ. And I also think he understands um, that the institutions are weak, that the institutions are weak and they can be reshaped and reformed. If I had told you uh, 10 years ago, I mean, when my book came, when I remember my editor saying to me, you can't, some of this doesn't pass the smell test that someone from outside the party could take it over. But if I had told you 10 years ago that a, uh, a guy who'd mostly given the Democrats and registered as a Democrat would within you know, four years end up the Republican president of the United States, you might think I was nuts. And, uh, and in fact, that's what's happened. You know, when I, when I talk about the rotting out of our institutions, I think the political parties are a perfect example. The most acute examples, in some sense, are political parties and media, but there are other interesting ones. I think, uh, back to the expertise question, I think universities deserve much greater scrutiny for a number of reasons. But uh, the political parties, the political parties used to be really local community efforts, right? People used to be very involved in their local Democrat or Republican parties, and that filtered up, and the convention was there was the state convention and then the national convention, and it really was, as you might say, a grassroots organization. And that did lead to various abuses of power, right? There were definitely smoke-filled back rooms where deals were made, no doubt about that. Um, you know, that's why Humphrey ended up with the presidential nomination, arguably. And the, um, but the, uh, the parties since more or less 1980 have gradually kind of given up that grassroots uh, infrastructure and become more and more focused on really becoming cocktail parties for major donors, both parties. This got very acute during the Clinton administration um, and then accelerated during the Bush administration. An excellent book, Elizabeth Drew, uh, The Corruption of American Politics, really describes how this happened. Um, and she talks in part about how um, uh, it w being elected to a national office uh, or a federal office went from being a, um, an act of public service to a career whose pinnacle was being a lobbyist. And th that, uh, that happened, and our political parties incur let it happen and encouraged it. And so, of course, they're rotted out. Of course, an outsider can come and totally hijack the party. And, and one of the reasons they're able to hijack the parties um, is, uh, is in part because um, uh, of the internet and small dollar contributions. So, you know, uh, one story I always tell, 1984, who ran for president in 1984? Ronald Reagan, and who was Democrat? Walter Mondale. And you know, what had Walter Mondale done before? Walter Mondale was Vice President of the United States. Uh, Jimmy Carter, right? Walter Mondale had spent his entire life working his way up the Democratic Party ranks, preparing to run for president. But you know, he was like arguably the most boring man in America. 
And he was going to run against a literal movie star. <laughs> and there were a lot of Democrats in this country who weren't so excited about Walter Mondale being the nominee, but it was kind of his turn, and I don't know what we're going to do. And then this young, charismatic, brash, compelling guy named Gary Hart wins the New Hampshire primary out of nowhere, crushes Mondale. I think it was 11 or 12 points. And it was a shock. And the headline on all the papers, you know, the young, charismatic senator who could actually beat Reagan crushes Mondale in the primary. And uh, so now let's go a little act of imagination. I know this is going to be a stretch. But let's say you're a liberal Democrat living in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And you, uh, 1984, you open your door, and there's the Boston Globe, and you pick it up, and you're like, oh, thank God, someone who can beat Ronald Reagan, Gary Hart. I want to help Gary Hart run for president. What do you do? Send him money. How are you going to do that? You got to write a check. Where are you going to mail it? U.S. mail. Well, people didn't know where to mail it. His campaign was only like 90 days old. There was the yellow pages, didn't carry it. Most, most municipalities didn't have 411 in 1984. And so actual story, truth, hundreds, thousands of people write on their envelopes, Senator Gary Hart, Washington, DC. All these m m checks show up in the mail at his Senate office. They can't have them there. They ship them to the campaign office in Colorado. I spoke to a woman who was a volunteer at the campaign office in Colorado when the US Postal Service backs up a truck. <laughs> and then they have to get volunteers to open the mail, take the checks out, endorse the back of the check. 1994 out of state check takes four to eight weeks to clear. <laughs> By the time he has the money in the bank, it's over. He couldn't, Gary Hart couldn't afford to rent a car because the checks were like in transit. And Mondale is crushing him on Super Tuesday. Now, fast forward to 2008, where you got a similar situation. Hillary Clinton, she and Bill Clinton built the Democratic Party. It is their party. She has spent her whole life in Democratic politics. She has been to every JJ dinner, kissed every baby, knows every donor's grandchildren's names. Like, this is their party. The idea that she would lose the nomination to a man who'd been in public life less than five years was unthinkable. Most of the Congressional Black Caucus endorsed Hillary, not Barack Obama. He wins in Iowa. He proves he can beat her. $100 million shows up within 48 hours on the internet, and he is immediately financially competitive with her. And in the next eight weeks during the sprint, He's able to keep pace with her financially thanks to the internet and small dollar donors. He doesn't have to go to a single fundraiser. She has to go to five fundraisers a day. They're, and so the, the, the role of the internet and small dollar donors in, in adding a degree of significant instability to the parties is very real and significant. Now, it only worked, in my view, because the parties were already corrupt and had totally rotted out. So like it only worked because they were dead to begin with and you could kind of hijack them that way. That last question was from Belfast and we'll get more from remote locations. <laughs> um, tell, thank you for being patient. Tell us your name and town. My name is Michael. I'm from Chicago, Illinois. Um, so I've got, a, I've got, it kind of works out to two parts. One is how do we change the incentive structure with journalism? Um, and that goes with um, how do we change the in the that that structure with newspapers, um, online, and you know traditional networks. But how do we change it between ourselves? Because traditionally, n journalism has been between you know in in institutions, but now it's it's so much more diff diffuse as you've mentioned it. How do we change the incentive structure away from you know drawing attention to ourselves and drawing attention to those those events that we that we're a part of, and how do we are how are we more truthful with our our fellow citizen? You really give me all the softballs tonight. It's like, uh, well, I guess I would say that um, in in journalism, it's always been a challenge, right? If it bleeds, it leads. Is is been true as long as people have been trying to sell newspapers. Um, and I also, I, I have this, um, 
I have this taped to my desk, Bill Paley, <laughs> right, when he ran CBS, apologized to shareholders for carrying JFK's funeral because they couldn't sell ads during it and it was really gonna negatively affect the quarterly performance of the company. <laughs> and I was just, you know, like there's always been uh, pressure in news uh, to, 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 to make money in part by delivering to people uh, what, you know, whatever they want. And I think the, I think the, you know, the best news organizations manage to mix, you know, the vegetables with the brownies, in a sense, in a way that, it's a disturbing <laughs> idea. <laughs> um, I guess not if the vegetable's marijuana, but the, uh, <laughs> the best news organizations manage to package things for people in a way that's both compelling but also has real civic value. I mean, one of the ways I think about this is, uh, oh, here, a great story. So Henry Luce, right, owns Time and Life magazine. And at the height of his power, pretty much everybody, almost every American household gets a magazine published by Henry Luce. And Henry Luce, he hates FDR. He thinks FDR is a commie pinko liberal destroying America and apple pie and trampling on the flag. And he wants to go to war against FDR in the pages of his magazines. But he's a little nervous about that because they just watched Hitler destroy the Jews and most of Europe in large part due to his use of radio, magazines, and newspapers. And so he calls his dear friend, president in the University of Chicago, Hutchins, and he says, um, President Hutchins, I'm gonna give you some money and I want you to tell me where the line is, right? What am I allowed to do? And so we have the Hutchins Commission, right? Hutchins Commission for two or three years has hearings and talks to people. Incidentally, a poet, a poet on the commission, Archibald MacLeish, and, um, uh, at the end, they published the Hutchins uh, Commission report, which, among other interesting things, says that um, you know the media, the media has the power to shape public opinion, and that means in a democracy, it has special responsibilities that other corporations do not have. And um, Luce is livid. He says this is the worst money he ever spent. <laughs> he hates it, but he lives by it, right? Even though he hates it. And uh, that commission goes on to inspire a range of public policy, including the Fairness Doctrine, uh, which was uh, repealed by Reagan, as we confirmed earlier today. And so uh, I think that, I, I, I believe that. I believe the media has, real, has a special responsibility in a democracy. And I try and imagine like Rupert Murdoch or Mark Zuckerberg calling, like, you know, I don't know, uh, you know, Larry Kramer, former dean of Stanford Law, and saying, uh, and now head of the Hewlett Foundation, and saying, hey, help me figure out where the line is. <laughs> and I just, I can't imagine that. And it's kind of sad in a way. Part of it, right, was that broadcasting was seen as a limited resource. And so we also, for instance, as broadcasters, we had special duties to perform public service. And now it's hard to say that we're a limited resource. Sure, the Fairness Doctrine comes out of the notion that the air is a, the air is a public utility, in a sense. And if you're going to broadcast on the airwaves, then we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna require you to do certain things. Um, but but the, Hutchins, the Hutchins Commission report isn't about that, per se. It's just about the, the roles and responsibilities of the media. There was a question over here. There's a, a person who's been chosen. Me? Where are you? Here oh, yeah. Oh, tell us your name, sir. Hi, my name is Dick Hoppel. I'm from Harwich, Massachusetts. Um, given what you've described as the sort of the fog of junk and the assault on facts, do you see, foresee any, any uh, model that can develop using a combination of AI and quantum computing and 6G that would empower individuals to uh, evaluate and understand 
truth and facts as a counterbalance to this fog? Well, uh, you know, okay. Is there a technological Is there, solution yeah. to this? I mean, despite the fact that I'm a technologist, I'm pretty skeptical about technological solutions in the short term. And also, ultimately, ultimately I am, you might say, an institutionalist, that um, we have to decide what our values are. Our values as a community, our values as a nation. David opened this with our values as a conference, right? How we're gonna ask questions and engage with each other. So I think you ha we have to decide what our values are, and then we can build technology around those values. But the technology itself will not be any specific solution if we don't really know what we want as a country, or as a community, or as a culture. And I think, you know, the fog of misinformation is, is not purely, it's a symptom in a sense, right? Not a, uh, not a root cause. And there, consequently, you know, solving for that root cause with by trying to solve the technology, I don't think will ultimately get us there. I think it can have real power and va value potentially along the way. Um, I will note quantum computing specifically, I think, is really quite a ways off in any kind of real way. Um, but, um, but broadly speaking on a technology solution, yeah. I'm, I'm skeptical that will solve the problems because I don't think these are actually technological problems. I mean, look, uh, in misinformation, I, you know, the election of 1800, it looked like John Adams was gonna lose. John Adams enlists all of his friends and he has the president of Yale, the president of Yale, write an editorial accusing Thomas Jefferson of keeping a slave harem in his basement. And, uh, and it was, and then they hired people to run through town saying Thomas Jefferson is dead, Thomas Jefferson is dead. I mean, if that's not misinformation, I don't know what is. <laughs> and then Jefferson has to hire people to run through town saying Jefferson's not dead, Jefferson's not dead. And so uh, these things have always been a part of the, of the landscape. The difference the difference is, the, is, is uh, I think the difference is twofold. One is the speed with which this technology has descended on our lives means that we're somewhat defenseless against it. We haven't built the kind of institutions and the individual resistance to it and, and, uh, and literacy in it the way we should. Uh, so one is it's just shown up really quickly and we're not ready for it. And the, the second thing is that it does have a, a speed and intensity that is unrivaled, that is like nothing we've ever seen before. You know, I, I like to call it radical connectivity. We are globally connected all of the time with, uh, with unlimited bandwidth. And those are, th that's a very different condition for humanity. And I'll note, in the next three to five years, there's about three billion people who are gonna come online in the next three to five years. Uh, a colleague of mine uh, wrote, just wrote a book on the subject called The Great Connecting, Jim Cashel. And uh, as part of his research, he was in rural Malawi and he bought a smartphone for $40 uh, with, uh, with a broadband plan in rural Malawi. And he said, yeah, well, you know, $40 versus your $1,000 iPhone, it's not quite the same, but it's pretty damn close. And um, we're gonna have another three billion people or so who also don't have the institutions and the same experiences of the past, uh, 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 you know, who, who don't have the institutions and aren't ready for this technology is gonna descend upon them. Which is why I go back to rule one, it will get crazier. We have unlimited bandwidth and connectivity with a satellite location, Rockland. Uh, here's the question from Rockland. What is the solution to the demise of local news? <sighs> Well, Jeff is gonna tell you that in his closing talk on Sunday. We'll just punt to then. I mean, look, the solution to local news is in local communities. Local communities have to care about it, have to want it, 
have to fund it. That's the solution to local news. You know, uh, uh, I remember at the LA Times uh, having breakfast with some of the CEOs of the biggest companies in LA and be like, why don't you buy any ads in the LA Times? Do, what, do you don't like Los Angeles? This is your hometown paper doing all this work for your community and like, come on, chip in here, kids. Like, communities have to want and care uh, about their local, their local institutions, especially their local news organizations. You shared something with me earlier today when we were on the radio that blew me away. Jotted it down, we gotta do this as a story. There is research suggesting a connection between lack of a local newspaper and lack of local media and having to pay more to borrow money for the local government? Correct. Uh, this was a, a study that I believe was out of Notre Dame uh, last year. And I think there's been another study along that showed something along the same lines, which is that uh, adjacent municipalities of roughly the same kind of economic success, uh, one without a newspaper, one with a newspaper, the one without a newspaper will pay somewhere between five to nine additional basis points on, uh, on uh, municipal bonds. And why, are, why is it so much more expensive to loan money to a town without a newspaper? Well, the assumption is, we can't prove it, but the assumption is corruption. There's an assumption that without the accountability of a local newspaper, you know, without the, the institution that holds power accountable, uh, it's, it's more expensive. Wow. Got one upstairs. Here comes the mic. And stand up, if you don't mind, is it okay? Hi, I'm Coley True, I'm from Woodstock, Maine, but I'm here with UMF tonight. And my question is, what do you think of students becoming professionals and in institutions if their positions are becoming less valuable, considering more and more information is coming directly from leaders and being distributed to the public without institutions? Is there a future in institutions? Yeah, well, uh, I actually think it's really essential for, uh, for young people to take jobs in institutions because it's the only way we'll ever change them, actually. Um, I, I know, and this may not necessarily be a popular view in this, in this room, but the, the reality is we need much younger generations of leadership. And um, <laughs> it, it makes me crazy it makes me crazy that pretty much every single member of the Democratic House and Senate leadership is old enough to be Paul Ryan's father. <laughs> that, that is just like a mind-boggling situation for me. And I really believe we need young people and fresh thinking in our institutions to, to help us reinvent this for the future, the future that is theirs, that is theirs that they will inherit. There's a... There, was, hi, how are you? I'm fine. I'm Scott Hoyt. I live in Greenwich Village on the island of Manhattan. <laughs> and I'm here to freeze my butt off. <laughs> <laughs> I can find my notes. Uh, it doesn't matter. So I'm the, I am the same age. I'm 66 and a half years old. I'm the same age as the average age of the six candidates debating on stage on last Tuesday. The average age is 66 and a half. Running against, a, running against a president who's 73 years old. So I have a tribal leader question. Since the world is gonna get crazier in the next 30 years, and we're not gonna be around as much to live through that, wouldn't it make more sense to have younger people active in political life and recognized by the media as being legitimate because their age is appropriate, not inappropriate? I, yeah. I mean, you, you just heard me say it, that, uh, that uh, you know, the average age of the Republican primary presidential candidates in 2016 was much lower than the Democratic ones in 2020. I mean, Marco Rubio, Ted Cruz, the, the, the Republican Party has done a much better job of cultivating the next generation of leadership. In the papers of the Constitution. Yeah. Average age was 44 of the, of, the, of the framers of the Constitution. So, uh, absolutely. So, I'm, I'm uh, 
And I'm, I'm 42, and I, I, I would definitely like to retire and hand off my spot to someone younger. Um, so. Um, let's see, I think we've got um, a remote question. Not remote, you're, you're off, you're, you're, it's like you're just sitting here. Off-site. Off-site from Portland. If we're in an age of rebuilding our new structure, <laughs> what should we build? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in other words, it's sort of like a, a, a what do we do starting Monday morning question. Like, how do we get started in whatever this future is? Let's, let's take it that way. Sure. Well, um, <laughs> you know, I think that uh, the two things that matter about local news, like I always think my great aunt Edna died in August. She was, uh, she was actually, I think, 10 days shy of her 102nd birthday when she died. She got the Boston Globe every morning, and all she did was skip right through to the horoscope and read the horoscope. <laughs> and now, along the way, she subsidized a lot of excellent journalism. Uh, but when we think about rebuilding our news infrastructure, I don't, we don't need some things like the horoscope. And if you want to follow you know, sports teams, national sports teams, you, you got ESPN. And if you want to follow national finance trends, you have Marketplace. And there's a, like a lot of the st stuff we want from the news you can get already out there. What, the two things you really can't get is local news. What is happening in your community? What are you, what do you care about? Uh, you know, why is, they're tearing down, that down and building something new. What are they building there and who, who's permitted that? And um, the other thing you need is you need investigative journalism. You need ways of holding power accountable. Um, I'll, tell you, uh, I'll tell you an interesting story, which is uh, at the Kennedy School about two years ago, maybe a year, uh, about two years ago, hosted a uh, conference on, um, on, on um, uh, election administration. And for a long and bizarre reason I can get into if you want, I, I'm super interested in the in the uh, minutia of election administration. And um, so they asked me to host a panel uh, about election administration with uh, Google and Facebook, and I had someone else there. I, maybe it was Spotify, I, I can't remember. Um, and uh, uh, because most Americans, when they wanna figure out where they go vote, go to Google or Facebook. And I was kind of expecting this a uh, crowd of like 100 election administrators to be full of anger and vitriol <laughs> to, the, to the Facebook and Google representatives on the panel about um, some different challenges there have been in that world of election administration. Um, and they, they were actually full of anger and vitriol, but not about election administration, actually about basically local news that local leaders, uh, election administration officials, and um, a lot of uh, local government bureaucrats, not, not just elected officials, really depend on local publications to communicate with local publics. And they felt like they had no vehicle to do that, really, on Google or Facebook. And it was a source of deep frustration to them. And so I think the question, which I don't know what I remember it exactly, was what can we do about it? Well, like I said, the solutions have to start in local communities. And maybe that involves you uh, putting more energy and attention into your local news outlet. Uh, maybe that involves you trying to start one. I mean, I'm a big believer that in some sense what we need is a new generation of news entrepreneurs, scrappy young entrepreneurs who will go try and figure this out in their communities. And to do that, you both have to be an entrepreneur and have a high tolerance for uh, failure and pain and trying new things. But you also have to be someone who really loves your community and wants to tell stories about it and wants to dig up some dirt and, <laughs> and have a real curiosity about what's happening. There's a question here. Yeah. Sir. Hi, Stephen Coltai, Lincolnville, Maine. If one of the problems with the news is that it's, it's been losing credibility, um, and it is in fact a profession like law or medicine or accounting, how do we know that journalists themselves are not part of the problem because they're not certified? There is no trade association where they self-regulate like doctors or lawyers or accountants. Would that be a possible way to solve the credibility problem? Yeah, some of us don't even think it's a profession. It's a craft. 
Yeah, that's a, you know, that's a good question. I mean, uh, we have a lot of journalism schools in the country. Um, more and more of them, I notice, are changing their names to their schools of journalism and communications because I think there are fewer and fewer jobs in journalism and more and more in communications and PR and marketing. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm open to that, about the idea of, cert of creating some kind of professional certification for journalists. I mean, practically speaking, uh, this is a, a very real and present issue. You know, uh, you can see Facebook face it all the time. What, uh, what constitutes, and, or Google does it, Google News, what constitutes a legitimate news source? What, what do we let get added to news.google.com? Um, uh, Walmart's, Walmart's investor relations blog, does that constitute a legitimate news source for news.google.com? Like, what are the standards that the platforms are going to use to evaluate what's news or not? And I think you can see them really struggling with this question very, very significantly, and frankly, appropriately so. Um, uh, the, you know, the, the, there are different certification standards for newsrooms, not necessarily for individual journalists, um, but it turns out that a lot of the standards practices vary pretty widely from newsroom to newsroom, and so it gets, that complicates the certification process. You can imagine it being, uh, that would be part of it if one went in that direction, but also there's some consciousness raising in education necessary on the consumption side. Uh, how many people really understand the difference between a uh, television news commentator and a television news reporter? It's extremely blurry when I talk to people. They think that it's the same thing. And that is a basic, profound, fundamental difference in what that person's role is. And people don't have a full understanding. They may not understand that a blogger with interesting opinions in a basement is somehow any different from a reporter trying, you know, a reporter at their best, trying to uh, bring some fact-based fact-checking to the equation. The clock says zero, zero, zero. The time is late. We have some really fascinating ideas coming at you tomorrow, and I'm sure we'll get some fascinating input coming from you tomorrow. Let us. Can, can I offer one closing comment, please? Uh, I am the co-founder of the Massachusetts Poetry Festival, now in its 14th year, and I want to close with a poem. I'm going to recite you a poem. And uh, this Thomas Hardy, when Thomas Hardy was born, electricity, electricity didn't exist, uh, the machine gun didn't exist, radio didn't exist. He was born in a different era. And it was December 1899, end of, end of the century. And he, he found the future that he was headed into in his, in his old age just bewildering. He just couldn't understand it. And he wrote this poem called The Darkling Thrush. I leaned upon a coppice gate when frost was specter gray and winter's dregs made desolate the weakening eye of day. The tangled vine stems scored the sky with strings of broken lyres, and all mankind that haunted nigh had sought their household fires. The land's sharp features seemed to be the century's corpse outlaint. The wind his death lament, his crypt the cloudy canopy, the wind his death lament. The ancient pulse of germ and birth seemed shrunken, hard, and dry. And every spirit upon the earth seemed fervorless as I. At once, a voice arose among the bleak twigs overhead in a full-hearted, even song of joy illimited. A darkling thrush, frail, gaunt, and small, had chosen thus to fling his soul upon the growing gloom. So little cause for caroling of such ecstatic sound was written on terrestrial things afar and nigh around that I could think there whispered through his handsome good night air some blessed hope whereof he knew and I was unaware. Yeah.